this. Like you have all your different things. Oh, and we're live. Okay. Hi everyone. I uh, had some technical difficulties setting up the YouTube live stream. For some reason, my computer decided to use the built-in camera on my laptop and not the web stream camera uh, that I wanted to use. So we've uh, restarted the stream. Hopefully people still come to here, despite me having sharing a different stream location. Difficulties. This is this is fine. Um, I'm just going to make sure that other things are also fixed. Oh, this is fine. This is fine. I'll fix this later. Um, I have finished my PhD in astrophysics and I feel really, really relieved about that. Uh, so what we're doing here is you can ask me anything about my PhD, about my PhD experience, whether it be about the research or the journey that I went on to get here. Um, oh goodness, this is, this is very, very exciting. Um, I can't believe that it's finally here. What is my PhD about? Let me tell you what my PhD is about. My PhD is about red clump stars. So there are lots of different types of stars in the universe. Our sun is one very specific type of star. It's a yellow dwarf star, uh, a main sequence star. So it is fusing hydrogen in its core. Now, the stars that I study are red giant stars. So these are stars that have gotten rid of all of their hydrogen in their cores, and now they have helium in their cores. But there are a few different types of red giants. So the ones that I care about are the first part, the first type are red giant branch stars. So after a star, a star like the sun burns through all of its hydrogen fuel in its core and turns all of that into helium, that core will shrink down and will make and get hotter and will make the outer layers of the star get hotter as well and will expand. So what happens also is once that core gets hot enough is that it will ignite a shell around the core of hydrogen fusion. So hydrogen will still fuse within these stars, these red giant branch stars, but only in a shell around this, what we call inert helium core. So the core isn't doing anything. It's just hanging out, just being helium. Uh, we also have another word for it. It's degenerate. It's a degenerate helium core because it's not doing anything. Um, so those are the first type of stars that I, I deal with. So red giant branch stars. The second phase of a red giant star, like stars like the sun that have gone past and they've gone through all of their hydrogen fuel, is the red clump. This is like a mock Viva. <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't have to do a Viva for my uh, PhD. So this is a good way to essentially do a bit of a, a Viva. Um, so moving on from the red giant branch is think about this. So you have your red giant branch stars that have their helium cores in the center and that shell of hydrogen fusion around the core. That hydrogen fusion is turning hydrogen into helium and helium is heavier than hydrogen. It's got more protons and more neutrons in the nucleus of those atoms. So they're heavier and they will fall down and add mass to the core of the red giant branch star. And as that's happening, the core is getting heavier. The core is getting heavier. And eventually once the core of a red giant branch star reaches about half the mass of the sun, or equivalent to half the mass of the sun, then helium fusion will ignite in those stars. And that, when that happens, when you have helium fusion happening in the core, still surrounded by a shell of hydrogen fusion, by the way, but once you have that active helium fusion in the core, that's when you have a red clump star. Now, red clump stars are really interesting, and I really like them, and you'd hope I'd really like them since I'm they did my PhD in them, but red clump stars, because they ignite that helium fusion at the same core mass. So regardless of the initial mass of the star, whether it be as low as 0 0.8 times the mass of the sun up until about two times the mass of the sun, um, regardless of where it is within that broad range of mass, that core will always ignite helium fusion at around half the mass of the sun, when that core is the half the mass of the sun. And because they always ignite that at that same core mass, these stars all emit 
pretty much the same amount of brightness. So since they emit about the same amount of brightness, they are really good at what we call standard candles. So a standard candle is essentially kind of like a street light. If you think about a street light, they all have the same globes in those street lights. And since they have the same globes, they emit the same amount of light, the same amount of power. But if you have a street light further away from you, it will appear dimmer, appear dimmer than the ones closer to you. And so you can use that relative brightness to work out precisely the distance of these particular stars. So they're really, really good. These red clump stars, we want to be able to use them. Is that a luminosity brightness? So, so luminosity, um, okay, let's describe luminosity versus brightness. So brightness is kind of a, an observational thing where you can you see how bright it is with your telescope or with your eyes potentially, whereas luminosity is an intrinsic property. So luminosity is the amount of light power that a star emits. So luminosity, regardless of its distance, will stay the same at a particular time. The, the luminosity of a star does actually change over time during its evolution, but it's not dependent on its distance from us. So brightness instead is dependent on the luminosity and the distance. So that there's the answer to your question of what's the difference between luminosity and distance. Grant, thank you for congratulating me on finishing my PhD. If you're just joining us, we're here doing an Ask Me Anything session about my PhD. I just submitted it yesterday and it feels like such a weight off my shoulders. You can see my little Kanban board up on the back with all the chapters in the done pile, which uh, feels, feels so, so good. Now I described what is the difference between these two red giant branch and red clump stars and why they're interesting. Actually, now, now I want to tell you why they're interesting. So these red clump stars, right? They've got the helium cores that they're burning, burning helium cores, and they're all emitting the same amount of light. Okay, so we can use them to map the galaxy really, really well. However, there's a little bit of a uh, challenge with using red clump stars to map the galaxy. And that's because they look very similar to red giant branch stars, which are not standard candles. So they overlap in both temperature. So they have very similar temperatures. They can have very similar surface gravities. So the Earth has a surface gravity. Stars have surface gravities as well because they are a mass contained in a space. And because they look very similar on the outside, it can be quite difficult to distinguish standard candle red clump stars from non-standard candle red giant branch stars. And we don't want to have these red giant branch star imposters contaminating our pristine red clump star sevels. So if that's difficult to do, then how are we going to, you know, separate these things to be able to have a pristine red clump sample? Oh, thank you, Isabel. That's so kind of you to say. And Enrique, thank you for congratulating me as well. Um, coming back to these things. So they're hard to distinguish with just looking at their surface features because they overlap. However, because they have different insides, so just a reminder, red clump stars, they're burning their helium in their cores with a shell of hydrogen fusion around them. And the red giant branch stars, they have an inert helium core, so they're not doing anything with the helium in their cores yet, surrounded by a shell of hydrogen fusion. Those slight differences in the internal structures of these stars gives them oscillations. So these stars will actually like pulsate in different ways, in slightly different ways because of the different internal structures. So this is where astroseismology comes into my PhD. Now, astroseismology is a really cool field. I wish I knew more about it. I know enough about it to understand what I need to understand in terms of the red clump stars and the red giant branch stars that I study or studied, I guess I still studied them. It's, uh, I don't want to get take a, get rid of it yet. I, I study these stars. I finished my PhD, but I still study these stars. Um, so we can use astroseismology. So astroseismology essentially requires a very long time baseline of observing. So you stare at a star with a telescope for a long time. There are many different telescopes and space probes out there in space that do specifically astroseismology. Um, 
you have things like Kepler, which is no longer working, I'm pretty sure, uh, but Kepler's space uh, telescope was one that did a lot of astroseismology, also looked for planets as well. Then you have TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, also an exoplanet thing, but it does do astroseismology as well. And you stare at these stars with these particular space probes for days. So let's see. The second Kepler program, so K2, so in, I think it was 2013, the Kepler space probe lost two, like, gyroscopy wheel type things that help it point in the right direction. Uh, but very, very smart people, scientists and engineers, came up with an idea to revamp the, the, Kepler, um, the Kepler probe and revamp the K2 survey, where essentially they were able to observe different things. But anyway... K2, I think, observed campaigns, so areas of the sky called campaigns, where stars would be inside it for about 80 days at a time. So you'd be staring at a star for 80 days, or multiple stars for 80 days, and gathering a lot of data for about 80 days. Uh, TESS has lots of, like, if you if you look at the, the sky as a sphere, TESS looks at long chunks of the sky for about 27 days but those chunks also overlap so some uh some regions of the sky particularly near the poles so at the um at the north pole and the south pole celestial poles in the sky it will be able to observe those parts for 356 days so a very long time again and then the initial kepler mission stayed at one part of the sky for four years so you're gathering a lot of data for astroseismology to be able to get enough information to be able to distinguish our pristine red clump stars, our standard candle red clump stars from your red giant branch stars, which is great. However, I only had four years to do this PhD. So what I did with my PhD is find a way to, or at least explore ways to be able to distinguish red clump stars from red giant branch stars by looking at their spectra. So when you look at a star with a telescope, the light comes through the telescope and you can put that light through different machines, different uh, instruments. One particular one being a spectrograph where essentially the light comes in and it gets spread out into a full spectrum, the full rainbow, depending on which part of the spectrum you're looking at. So I used two different types of data. I used data from a spectrograph called the X shooter spectrograph, uh, which covers the visible light. So visible light from blue to red and also into infrared. So into that part of the spectrum that we can't see with our own eyes uh, and looks for particular signatures within that spectra that indicate, okay, these particular features in the spectra will be able to tell us if it's a red clump star or a red giant branch star. And I also used another telescope called the, uh, well, the Anglo-Australian telescope. So it's one in Coonabarabra in central New South Wales. And I used that telescope with the Veloce spectrograph, which is a relatively new spectrograph. It's only been around and working since 2018. Um, and I, it's a very high resolution one. So we can get a lot of detail with that particular spectrograph. So I used that one, observed those stars myself and looked at that particular part of the spectrum that that telescope and spectrograph looks at, which is again in the optical, more into the red part of the optical spectrum and a little bit into the near infrared as well. So I have lost my track of thought. We're talking about what I did. So yes. So basically I also used this uh, program called the cannon, which is not named after an actual like, you know, artillery cannon thing, but uh, it's named after actually Annie Jump Cannon, which is one of the Harvard astronomers or Harvard computers who worked at Harvard uh, Observatory with I forget the astronomer's name, but Annie Jump Cannon, she was awesome. She uh, was able to classify stars by just looking at their spectra, which is really cool, looking at the patterns in their spectra just by eye. Really so, super impressive woman. Uh, and so the program that I use is named after her because it too only looks at the actual observed spectrum of a star to look at patterns and then classify them based on whatever you want to classify them with, which is really, really cool. So I use that program to look through all the data and find interesting things. And then I, I interpreted the results from that. And then that's basically my PhD. <laughs> 
Oh, thank you all so much for being here. I've been going on a bit of a rant about what I actually did. Let's catch up on some questions and see what uh, we have. Enrique asks, question, what is the difference between the red clump stars and the tip of the red giant branch? Oh, great question. I wonder if I have a figure that I can show you. It might be, oh, it's actually, I remember it's a, it's on its side actually, so I won't show you the figure, but um, to give you an idea. So we talked about red giant branch stars, so our sun, will turn into a red giant branch star and it'll go up the red giant branch and reach the tip of the red giant branch. The tip of the red giant branch is essentially the, the well, the top of it where, hello, <laughs> the top of it where um, uh, the point where the helium flash happens. So helium flash being, this is when the helium starts to fuse and occur, which then at the tip of the branch, they come back down. Uh, the tip of the red giant branch, Enrique, you can also actually use that also as a uh, standard distance indicator as well. So I believe oh, there was a brief study I read about recently. I think it was a JWST study looking at a galaxy of some kind nearby and where they, they've used, yeah, a galaxy of some, pi, of some kind nearby um, that they used red giant branch stars, but there's the tip of the red giant branch stars to like indicate how far away this particular galaxy was, I believe. I'll have to look into that. I have so many cool things to catch up on in terms of science when I was buried underneath my entire PhD. Um, but yeah, because that tip of the red giant branch is at a particular spot, you can actually yeah use those also as a distance indicator. But I was just sticking to the red clumps versus the red giant branch, the, the first ascent of the red giant branch, so the bottom part of the red giant branch. Okay. Oh, thank you all so much for your well wishes. It feels so awesome to have finished my PhD. Yes, you can see the stack where, hold on, there we are, the stack of uh, done behind me here. Uh, these are all my chapters. So you have the uh, conclude, not conclude, well, I can start with conclusions. Yeah, we had conclusions. We have introduction. I did a technical chapter, which describes all the uh, tools whether they be compute computational tools or the spectrographs that I talked about before and how they use those. Um, then then three science chapters and the conclusions. Was, oh, and also the acknowledgements are in there too. Oh, and a abstract, had to write an abstract as well, which is like a top line summary. It had to be within 350 words. And it's it's a bit it's a little challenging to summarize your entire four years of research into less than 350 words but i managed to do it with so that that is that is good uh it feels great oh a question from tiktok will the james webb space telescope help you in studying these stars that you study potentially i'm not sure if they might be too bright because all the stars that i've been studying are in the milky way galaxy in fact all the stars that i looked at were within about or was it, they were either within about 1,000 parsecs, so about 3,000 light years from the sun, so not very far away. Um, but I'm sure JWST will be able to look at some ones that are further away, uh, whether they be in the galaxy but further along or maybe in nearby galaxies potentially. Um, the only thing with JWST, as far as I'm aware, is that it can only look at one uh, object at a time. I don't know enough about how to use JWS 6. I haven't used it in my research, but I'm sure it would be useful for a few things. Uh, it'd be kind of fun to look at some red comp stars with JWST. <laughs> <laughs> um, more questions. Uh, congrats, Dr. K. Thank you, Mike. I'm not quite Dr. K yet, but I will be Dr. K eventually. Um, any chances I'll be invited back onto the Infinite Monkey Cage? Ooh, I don't know. If anyone doesn't know, I, I have been on the Infinite Monkey Cage, which is a podcast, a science podcast with uh, Professor Brian Cox and Robin Ince. And it's, oh, I had such a fun time chatting with them. In fact, chatting about my PhD with them, which was great fun. Uh, did someone buy you a PhD sword? No, I didn't get a PhD sword. I did ask the department if I could get a PhD sword. Uh, but they said no, but instead they throw me a party. Uh, so I guess that's okay. <laughs> no, I'm very, very honored that um, the department's going to celebrate PhDs, finishing their PhD and submitting their PhD uh, more often now, which is really, really lovely. Ah, oh, Matt, 
What have I been putting off in life because of your PhD that you'll be able to do now? Read anything but my PhD. Read. Oh. House, shut up. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can hear Jamie out there. <laughs> but yes, also housework. We recently moved uh, when we came back from a trip in Europe. We're going over in Europe to, well, for me to collaborate with people over in Europe, which was awesome. Um, <laughs> My dad has entered the chat and says to come fishing. Uh, if I do that, I will definitely bring Jamie to, to do the fishing and I will read while you fish and then I will eat the fish while I still read. <laughs> but no, I'm really excited to read books. I have a stack of like four books currently that I want to read, one of which that um, my to-be father-in-law gave me for Christmas. Uh, he is really good at buying like books that I, I don't really like buying books for myself. So I don't know. I feel like it's a big investment to think, oh, I don't know if I'm going to like this or not. So it's a bit of pressure picking a book, but he picked this book, uh, which is the same as the one from the previous Christmas that he gave me or the same author. And the one, that one, I smashed that one. So I'm really excited to read this book and enjoy this mystery. It's, it's called, um, Someone on this train is a murderer, I think is the, the name of the book, but I'm really excited to read something other than my thesis or other than papers about things that I need to know for my thesis. Um, so I'm looking forward to be able to do that as well as get back to making content about space and have fun talking about space and learning about space with you guys again. I really miss doing that. So I'm excited to get back into making content. I have some plans for some YouTube videos. So we'll get into that. I also have this new big space up here, this big space over here where I still don't know quite what to do with it yet. I definitely have some ideas for some corners of the room to uh, have you know different places to record stuff. So we've got a lot of exciting things to come along and also just get the rest of the house in order because we're still, we've still got lots of boxes all around. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that's what I plan to do and just relax a little bit, have some fun. Um, what would be my dream job now that my PhD is over? Well, okay. I wasn't sure if I was going to mention this until I knew more about it, but I may as well. Uh, I've applied for a postdoc. So after you finish a PhD, you can go on and do more research in an actual, you know, position, a full-time academic position with an actual salary. Oh, imagine that. I've <laughs> been on a student stipend for four years. Um, but yes, I've applied for a postdoc uh, in a similar sort of field that I'm working on. So for those asking who have just joined in, I've just finished my PhD in astrophysics, looking at stars, red giant stars in the Milky Way galaxy and distinguish them between them, uh, different types of red giant stars by looking at their spectra. So taking their light and breaking it up into a big rainbow. Um, but this postdoc that I've applied for is a similar thing, also looking at stars in the Milky Way, but less so within the, the disk of the galaxy. So our Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. It has a disk. It's got a bulge at the center. We're inside the disk. We, we spin around. Um, instead, the postdoc will be focusing on stellar streams. So these are stars that are in streams around the Milky Way because the Milky Way has merged with other galaxies, other small galaxies or globular clusters, which are like this. I don't really know how to describe globular cluster than just to say it's a glob or blob of cluster stars, of all stars all together. But when these objects merge in and fall into the Milky Way galaxy, they leave behind streams of stars as they fall in and break apart. So what I, I will hopefully do, fingers crossed, if I get that job, I'm still here to find out if I got the job or not, um, is I will be studying stream stars in the Milky Galaxy to then, what's really cool about being able to do that is we can then also, we can then also figure out the shape of the dark matter in the Milky Way Galaxy. So like the dark matter halo, we can map the dark matter in the Milky Way Galaxy by looking at these stream stars. So that would be something that I might be able to do. We'll find out. Soon, I hope, I, I applied for this job many months ago and had uh, a, an interview for it many weeks ago, um, almost over a month ago, actually, more than a month ago. Yeah, so look, we'll see, we'll find out. Um, <laughs> Flubby, will I join Taskmaster season three? Oh, 
I would love to go in Taskmaster. I love that show. I feel like I could be a little creative. It'd be, be fun. Um, uh, da, da, da. Is there a chance I will look into the stories from Indigenous peoples and look at them from a Western perspective? Uh, yes, I think so. I do like to uh, incorporate my astrophysics knowledge and champion the knowledge of uh, Aboriginal and Indigenous stories. So it's definitely something that I will be looking into and continue to champion throughout everything that I do with when it comes to space things. Um, you're out here getting jobs. Well, I did, no, I'm not quite getting a job yet. Hopefully getting a job sometime soon. Um, oh, another question. Was there something surprisingly easy throughout your PhD? Ooh. Something surprisingly easy. I'm not so sure. There were definitely times where it was easier than it had been, but it has also been a very big struggle recently because trying to really get to the end of the PhD has been uh, difficult. But something is surprisingly easy. Actually, I would say probably the least technical thing, despite it probably sounding quite technical, um, is observing. So during 2020 and 2021, I applied for observing time on the Anglo-Australian telescope. So this is a big telescope, the biggest optical telescope in Australia, located in central New South Wales. And using that telescope to observe some of the red giant stars nearby the Milky Way, or nearby the sun rather. And while observing, you basically just stay up all night make sure the telescope's doing its thing, make sure it does the right stuff, observes the right stars, is pointing in the right direction, and watch Netflix. Scroll through TikTok. <laughs> I did a lot of that during my nights of observing, but that part I feel like was easy. That still was difficult though in a way that it was, I remember in 2021, I was awarded, I applied for and was awarded 10 nights of observing time in winter, I think it was. Uh, around the time when New South Wales and Australia had their more regional lockdowns start to happen. So I had my 10 days and near the end of the 10 days, the more the broader lockdowns happened in regional New South Wales. And basically what had happened is usually with this particular telescope, you can change over the top end of the telescope to use different instruments and use it for different things. So I was doing my thing 10 nights in a row don't recommend doing that. But 10 nights in a row, going towards the end, they're like, okay, we can't get enough people in to change over the top end to then let the next people do their observing. So you're just going to have to keep observing until we can figure this out. So I got an extra, I think, four nights. So I was at the end, two whole weeks of working at night, observing stars at nighttime which was great. I gathered much more data than I expected. I only expected to get, I think, 150, 200 stars, uh, but I ended up getting 300 stars in total observed, which was awesome. However, two weeks straight of night shift is difficult and quite, quite hard. Um, work my, my day, my usual day or night on those particular times when I was observing, I would wake up at 2 p.m., have breakfast <laughs> of some kind, and then get started with calibration. So you start the telescope doing certain calibration uh, measurements and whatnot from about 4, 4 p 3, 4 p.m. And then once the sun goes down, you're observing and doing all fun things, watching Netflix, scroll through TikTok, make sure the telescope does the right thing. And then finally go to sleep when the sun comes up, and I think it was around 7 a.m. or so, and then sleep all day. Uh, and that was really difficult. There were really long nights, short days, because uh, it was through winter. So that was a difficult part of that. But the actual observing wasn't particularly technical. Uh, it was quite easy to, easy to grasp and easy to just kind of do, which was good. One thing that kept me going through that full two weeks of night shift is every time, because I was observing from home because of the the, um, the lockdowns, uh, which was actually quite convenient. I quite enjoyed being able to finish the night and just walk, I don't know, like 20 steps to my bed and just sleep, just completely dead to the world, sleep for a couple of hours until I had to start at 2 p.m. and wake up. But the thing that kept me going, uh, apart from that, was every time I'd wake up at 2 p.m., 
my partner was still at home. So Jamie, you heard him earlier. He threw a ball at me. Um, he would, despite the fact that it was very much into the afternoon, he would always say good morning to me when I woke up at 2 p.m. And that was really sweet. I, I, you know, it's like little, little tiny things that kept me going. Uh, do I have my own telescope at home? I do. It's, it's in one of these cupboards currently. Um, but I, I wonder if we can use this uh, sunlight to look through, or uh, skylight rather, to look through and see stars. It's not very big, so I won't see a lot of the sky, but it, it might be fun to be able to point it up through there. But I do have a little five inch telescope, so five inches wide, it's computerized. You can um, control it with a, uh, a phone and an app, which is kind of cool. But yeah, nice little telescope. Can't wait to call you a doctor. When can I call myself a doctor though? So currently my PhD thesis has been sent off. It's not quite ready to be sent off to reviewers because uh, apparently it's a difficult thing to find a suitable reviewer. I have one reviewer currently and there's another one being worked out, but I've been told that it's, it's all good, things will happen and I will not have to worry about it, thank goodness. Um, but what will happen is once it gets sent off to two reviewers, they will have six weeks to review my thesis and come back with some sort of uh, examination, award, degree, uh, some sort of decision about the thesis. So they have a few options. They can either say award this right now, which means give this girl a PhD. She, she deserves it. Please, pretty please, that'd be so good. Uh, basically, yeah, award this PhD without having to make any changes, which would be awesome. So if both reviewers say that, I will be awarded the degree pretty much straight away, which is good. Um, what's more likely to happen is that they'll come back with maybe some minor revisions. So a few small things to change, in which case when that comes back, I'll have two weeks to make those revisions and make a bit of a reviewer report and then send that back to the graduate research school at the university and they'll all be like, oh, did you did you do the things that they said for you to do? Yes, no, great, cool, we'll, we'll award you the degree now. So it could be about two months before I get awarded the degree, but that's still not technically when you can call me doctor or when I can call myself doctor. Um, so <clears throat> when that comes through and I get the email saying, congratulations, you've been awarded the degree, I have to wait until my conferral date so the degree actually has to be conferred. So as far as I understand it, that means it has to be signed by someone, uh, a, a dean of some kind, I assume. Um, at that point, when it's conferred and the degree is actually signed, that the certificate is signed by the conferral person, uh, then I can call myself doctor. But apparently in that email that I get when it says, congratulations, you've been awarded the degree of doctor of philosophy, in astrophysics, uh, they will say when the conferral date is on that email, I have been told. So I'll be, I will be able to know, I will know what date I can start being like, I'm, I'm a doctor. Uh, for those who are just joining us, I've just finished my PhD in astrophysics studying red giant stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And we're talking about all things about my PhD. You can ask me anything about my actual research to my experience to anything about the entire journey that I've been on for the last four years. Uh, Julie, I agree. Dr. Banks does sound really cool. <laughs> Dr. Kirsten Banks, Dr. Astra Kirsten. I just, I'm so excited to use that uh, and use that, uh, that term, which would be awesome. Um, okay, do you have a physical copy of your thesis so you can see the stack? Well, let me tell you a few stats about my thesis. I wrote this down. Hold on, give me one moment. I wrote this down yesterday while I was waiting to press the button. So I wanted to have all the PhDs around me. But some stats about my PhD. It is a total 311 pages. <laughs> 311 pages from, from top to tail, 311 pieces of paper. So many pieces of paper. Oh my goodness. Um, the actual, that, that, that does include like the, the front matter stuff. So like the acknowledgements, the declarations, the title page, that includes all of that. The actual main part where the numbers are actually numbered with numerical numbers, like one, two, three, four, uh, 275 pages. Uh, there are 52 figures, so 52 plots in my thesis, uh, 20 tables, where some of those tables are just longer versions of shorter tables, but still 20 tables in total. 
and I put it through a word counter thing, but I, it doesn't quite like to handle uh, PDFs very well. So a bit of a um, estimate here. Over 60,000 words is the estimate of how many words are in my PhD thesis in astrophysics, which is absolutely insane. Um, let me tell you as well, 311, not bad. Yeah. Oh, 350, you've had a uh, document. That's, wow. <laughs> That is crazy. Um, oh, a red jump, a red clump giant stars suitable to be observed by amateur astrophysicists or spectroscopists. Um, I, I would assume so. Yes, yes, I would think so. Like some of the stars that I observed were magnitude eight at their brightest, which is you couldn't really go any brighter than that with the telescope that I use because it's a big, big telescope, four meter wide mirror in this particular telescope that I used to observe the red giant stars for my thesis. Um, but I think, if I remember correctly, Arcturus, so the heart of the scorpion, I think is that star, Arcturus. Um, uh, not Betelgeuse. No, that one's not a red clump star. But Arcturus, I think, might actually be a red clump star. Um, it's definitely a red giant. Whether it's actually a, a red clump star, I'm pretty sure it might be. Um, thank you, Carl, for being here. Thanks for dropping in. Um, Sammy from Sydney, are there any papers on archive or anywhere else you can read? Yes, actually, <laughs> I got an email this morning um, that my latest paper is now officially published, which is exciting. Like I knew it got accepted to the journal, but it is it is published now. Um, but if uh, you go to the link in my bio, either on TikTok, I think on YouTube as well, if you go to the link in my bio, there is a, on the page that takes you to, it's on my website, there is a list of all my uh publications that I've written there or have been a part of uh, in there. So you can find it and check it out. Uh, it's all open source. So you can go and find them. You don't have to worry about having a subscription to anywhere. You can read my research. Uh, oh, and Terry's. Thank you, Enrique. Uh, and Terry's might be the Red Clump style that I was talking about before. But yes, with my research, you can read my papers. I have two research papers that made up part of this, this, this entire thesis here, um, which is indeed done. Oh, thank goodness. Um, yeah, two, two papers have been published out of that so far. And there's a third one that I want to publish later, but it wasn't the science we did and that wasn't quite paper ready to submit to a journal, but we're gonna put that together into a nice little, nice little paper to publish soon. Mm. Oh, Julie, hold on. Where, where'd your comment go? Can you share one of your favorite or funniest memories from your PhD journey? Favorite or funniest memories? There was a funny time when um, I came into the uni and I was wearing the same thing as two other PhD students because <laughs> we all got the same hoodies from this uh, conference that we went to a couple of years ago. And we all came in wearing the same hoodie, which is kind of funny. Uh, but no, another funny thing actually that comes to mind. Um, in my last science chapter, I was using the red clump stars that I had observed to look at the properties of the solar neighborhood. So within about uh, 3000 light years from the sun, what are the properties of the Milky Way in that little box? And when I was trying to uh, measure the distance to the red clone stars in my sample, I had forgotten a sneaky factor of 10 to the 2.5 um, <laughs> and accidentally calculated the distance to my stars uh, being not only outside the galaxy, which is completely uh, incorrect, they were definitely inside the galaxy, but also outside the entire universe. <laughs> The observable universe, that is. The universe may be infinite. Uh, we're still yet to figure that out and be uh, sure about that. But yeah, I accidentally uh, missed a sneaky factor of 10 to the 2.5 and calculated the distance to my stars being outside the entire universe, the observable universe. So, oopsie. I thankfully have a good head and <laughs> recognize that straight away. It's like, oh, those numbers are too big. <laughs> And then, yeah, immediately, yeah, immediately realized it was math related and double checked my, uh, my calculations. I think I might, the page will probably be in here somewhere of where I tried to do the math. And I think the math is correct in my notes, but I just, um, oopsie and forgot. Yeah. 
Wait, no, that's error propagation. Oh, no, that's correct. So this is the, the um, it's a little thing for people on YouTube. There's the, this the, uh, the distance modulus. So this is a way to measure the distance between stars. If you know the absolute magnitude, so the absolute brightness of a star, and you observe the apparent magnitude or the apparent brightness of your star. Uh, and if you look at, you can see that on TikTok as well. And the A as well is um, an extinction factor or a reddening factor. So because there's dust between us and stars, that will preferentially uh, change the apparent brightness of these stars and so you have to like correct for that but i did that in kind of a cool way i use this uh, like map that integrates the distance and like oh it will redden by this much and it worked out really well but yeah forgot that um little factor of a 0.2 actually it was a little factor there and um oopsie calculated the distance to stars outside the observable universe ha <laughs> ha but that's okay um it all worked out in the end they were all within the solar neighborhood within about 3,000 light years from the sun and all was good with the world and they showed similar properties to what has been found before. Um, couldn't find my research on my website. Okay, yeah, so if you, if you, I'll, I'll make sure that that's more accessible uh, on my website where you can see uh, and read my research. But yeah, if you search Keston Banks archive, you'll probably find it pretty easily, but I'll make sure that that's uh, accessible after this live. Uh, so when do I defend my thesis? So I don't actually have to defend my thesis. This is a common thing uh, in many PhD things, uh, programs, is that people do a defense or some sort of viva. But for some reason, that's not a thing in my program. Uh, oh, the sun's getting bright. I'm getting a bit dark on some of the, on the video. That's okay. So instead, my thesis is kind of treated like a paper where it gets sent off to reviewers and the reviewers will review it kind of like a paper and send back comments or, or, or otherwise. Um, and then I'll get a degree, I, I would hope. <laughs> That's the plan, at least. But no, I don't have to do a, a Viva. But they have actually just changed that for PhDs at my university. Starting, well, if they started last year or the year before, they now have to do a defense and a Viva at the end of their program. Uh, so, <laughs> Enjoy that, guys. I don't have to do that, but but you but you will. I don't know what I would prefer, actually, which is kind of interesting because I, I do a lot of communication. I do presentations. I do speak. I make videos, so on and so forth. But it feels different when you're giving a presentation about your research, where technically you are the expert on your PhD thesis. You've been doing this for three, four years, however long your PhD is and how long your, your research is. You are the expert in your field. But the way I think about it is like if you're doing, I, and I get nervous before doing um, presentations at conferences as well, because there are so many smart people in the audience, uh, <laughs> which is a, just a bit intimidating uh, personally for myself. But it's okay. Uh, you, you get through it. But yeah, I, I don't know if I would prefer to have a defense where I have to answer questions from people in the room uh, on the spot, just know my thesis in and out, which I do know my thesis in and out to be fair, but still, I don't think I would wanna do that. I am much prefer this particular situation where I send it off and I don't have to think about it. Don't have to worry about it for like two months, maybe six weeks-ish. So I, I quite like this particular situation where my PhD is written, it's done, it's sent off, and it will go to some reviewers and it'll come back. So technically it's not done, done. It is done and it's submitted. But once I am assuming that I'll get some sort of minor comments back at the very least, in which case I'll have to fix those and then I'll be done, done. Uh, but I'll keep you here along the way and yeah, keep you in. In, in all in the loop with all the things that happen um but yeah that's what it is otherwise other than just the papers my actual thesis itself once it's done done and I get the award I get to the degree uh, it will be available on my university's library website uh so that should be accessible to everyone as well so yeah it's like a huge paper uh essentially this PhD and that's how it's being treated um, but yes, you'll be able to read my entire PhD thesis if you like. Um, let me tell you the, the title that I went with, by the way. So the title 
for those who are just joining in, so I finished my PhD in astrophysics looking at red giant stars in the Milky Way galaxy. The title that I went with is The Spectroscopic Disambiguation of the Red Clump from the Red Giant Branch. That is my PhD thesis title, The Spectroscopic Disambiguation of the Red Clump from the Red Giant Branch. And I'm so looking forward to my graduation where the person has to read that out and, and say that and say, yeah, that. <laughs> uh, what do I want to do next? Well, immediately, I'm looking forward to sleeping and reading other th things other than my thesis, but uh, I may potentially have a postdoc position. I haven't been told if I have been accepted into that position yet, but fingers crossed that I might get that job. That'd be really cool. It looks really awesome. Um, otherwise, I'm still going to be making content and turning this content into a business as well. So I'll still be around making content. I'm very excited to do that and just oh, have lots of fun again. I mean, I was having fun during my PhD, but more fun <laughs> doing it, doing all sorts of things. Um, <laughs> should say my title 10 times fast. That'd be, that'd be difficult. There's, there's a lot of vowels and, and, <laughs> and stuff in there. Um, okay, so skimming quickly on my paper, Sammy, you've asked a major reason telling red, client, red clumps from other red giants is to reliably use the non-clumps as standard candles. So close. So, so to, to, spectroscopically disambiguate <laughs> the red clump and the red giant branch is to, um, yeah, isolate red clump stars, which are standard candles. So the red clump stars are the standard candles. Isolate them from the red giant branch. So the other red giants, because they're not standard candles. Uh, so that is what the, the point is, essentially. Mike, thank you. Best of luck with the postdoc. Hopefully it all happens. Um, how old am I? I will happily answer that question. Uh, I'm 26 currently, um, turning 27 in May. So the the <laughs> the race is on to see whether or not I get awarded my PhD while I'm still 26 or when I'm 27. I, can't, I really hope it's before my birthday. It just, that would be nice. You know, it's like, oh, PhD at 26. I mean, it's a pretty common age, I think, if you go through all of your undergrad and do a PhD straight away. Um, I took a little bit longer. So my undergrad, I did um, I did a Bachelor of Science with a major in Physics, which was a three-year degree, uh, but I did it in three and a half years because during semesters, you generally do four subjects per semester when I was there. Uh, but I found that that was a little bit too much for my liking. And so towards the end, I was just doing three courses per semester and did an extra semester instead. And then took a semester off because I was finishing in the middle of the year, took a semester off, did an honors year. So if you're joining in from the US, you may have heard more about a master's instead. So an honors is kind of like a one year master's where you do research as well. Um, and you do some courses too, some higher year degree courses. So I did an honors year as my, I guess, technically fifth year because I did three plus a half into four. And then fifth year was my honors degree. And then I did my PhD, which my particular PhD program was four years in total instead of usually three or three and a half for uh, general PhDs in Australia. Uh, but my PhD was a kind of special program where you get four years of funding. Um, <laughs> yeah, the amount of hex debt I must have accumulated. I, well, it was, yeah, there's, there's a bit. There's a bit. But it's okay. Once I get a real job it will, uh, you know, be taken care of by my paycheck, right? <laughs> Don't have to worry about it. It's like, it's fine. Um, my, my accountant slash my dad will say differently. <laughs> but um, so, yes, I, I was at university for a little over nine years in total then. So nine years to finish my, uh, my entire degree, degrees. So undergrad, honours, and now PhD. So hopefully, to sum that up, I will be Dr. Kirsten Banks at 26 before my birthday. It's it's possible. I really think it's possible that it'll come along and happen. Let's, fingers crossed for minor revisions from the reviewers and that the reviewers get sent the PhD quite quickly. Ah, gosh. Love the cup. Ah, thank you. It's not my fault. I'm awesome. It is. Did I choose this on purpose? Maybe a little. Could I have chosen a plain black mug? Yes. 
Did I want to? No. <laughs> I do also have actually an old mug, which I need to take downstairs to, to clean it. But this one is uh, the first paper, the first first author paper I re ever wrote. This was about my honors research, which was actually about the evolution of galaxies outside the Milky Way. And then I changed to the evolution of the Milky Way, looking at stars in the Milky Way when I started my PhD. Um, I have now since, as of this morning, published two other papers. So I have, excuse me, I have two other mugs to make so I can have my collection. <laughs> Oh, great question. Uh, what made you want to follow science out of high school? Well, the whole reason why I wanted to do physics and astrophysics was because in about year nine or year 10, my science teachers took my entire year group on an excursion to go see a documentary about the Hubble Space Telescope. And when I was watching that documentary, I was like, wow, damn, space is really cool. <laughs> the things that astronomers do is really interesting. And so I decided, all right, I'm going to do physics. I'm going to do maths. I'm going to make sure that I go and do things like that. And so that's why I went along to do physics at university and astrophysics as a PhD. I actually didn't think I would do it. I, well, a fun, another funny story is uh, my parents took me to go visit uh, one of my dad's good friends who was a like an engineer professor um, at a university in Australia. And we went into his, uh, he's like a civil engineer sort of type person. And we went into his lab when his lab is like this big warehouse type thing. And his job at the time was to basically break chain links, but like not small chain links, like small chains, like on a necklace, no massive chain links that make the chains of, uh, the, the anchors for massive ships. So these huge things, and his job was to break them just to see how, you can improve them, I guess. Um, but the thing that I remember more from that visit is I met his most recent postdoc that he had just hired. So he just finished his PhD and was just hired as a postdoc under uh, this person. And I was talking to him. He's like, oh, yeah, you know, I've been at university for 10 years and now I have a job. I'm like, please, I won't be doing that. I, I won't be at uni for 10 years. Stop it. That's ridiculous. nine years later. <laughs> I've been at university for nine years now. Uh, thanks, Dad. So Professor James Murray Parks uh, in Swinburne is the name of the uh, the engineer. Um, yeah, so I, <laughs> I never thought I'd do a PhD. I knew I wanted to do astrophysics. And then basically, I just kept taking opportunity after opportunity that kept coming. So once I got towards the end of my undergrad degree, I'm like, you know, what? yeah, sure, I could, I could do research. Let's, let's give it a try. I'll do honours and get into the honours program. Uh, and then partway through honors, the honors coordinator was like, hey, we think you'd be a good fit for this PhD program. You should apply. I'm like, all right. So I applied. And now we're here at the end of this PhD. <laughs> uh, so I started at 17. Yeah, I did start university at 17. Uh, I was a bit young for my year. So <laughs> the first semester of university was challenging, especially when all of my friends wanted to go hang out at the university bar and I could not do that because I was not 18 yet, but that's okay. I uh, had plenty of time being over 18 at university <laughs> now. Um, but yeah, so hopefully I will be a PhD of astrophysics before I turn 27. Oh, ah, uh, sure. Uh, hello. Do you plan to visit UNSW from time to time in the future? I sure do. I sure do. Uh, I still have to pack up my desk. <laughs> at uni. I'm keeping my stuff there at the moment for when I have to go back to fix up any sort of uh, revisions by the reviewers. But I do plan to visit UNSW uh, in the future, drop in every now and then to catch up with the other PhDs who are still doing their PhD. Uh, yeah. I've been at UNSW for nine years. They can't get rid of me that quickly. <laughs> Plus I have to go back for my graduation as well. So I'll definitely come back for graduation. I am so excited to get the floppy hat. I have the, the, oh, the, I don't have the hard hat up here, but um, it's around here somewhere, but I get an upgrade of the hat. So when you do undergrad, you get the flat cap thing with the, with the flat cap, but then with a PhD, you get a fluffy hat. I'm so excited to get the fluffy hat. <laughs> uh, and the graduation will be live streamed and I'm pretty sure I can share the, the link to the live stream. Um, so I will do that when it comes time as well. 
An hour has gone by so quickly. It is almost midday. So we will uh, take a few more questions and I'll wrap this up soon. But thank you all for so much for being here and chatting with me and celebrating with me that I've finished my PhD. It's all it's all done. It's all done. <laughs> uh, it feels absolutely insane that this has finally, finally happened. Four years of a PhD is a long time, but also it's not just the accumulation of four years, it's the accumulation of nine years of tertiary education, uh, not to mention all the years in, uh, you know, secondary education. You know, it's a, been learning almost all my life, and I hope to keep learning for the rest of my life as well. Thank you. I've seen the congratulations coming in. Thank you all so much. Those who have been here on TikTok, those who have stuck around on YouTube as well. Uh, this has been so, 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 so awesome. Uh, please run for president. Um, I, I don't think I can because I've not been born in the US. I am Australian and we don't have presidents. Um, but I, I am so honored that uh, this is something that you would want me to do. That, that's really that's a really cool honor. Uh, yeah. Oh, a question. Let's have a few other questions. I'm looking to sell my PhD. Any advice on picking a supervisor? This is such an important thing to consider when choosing a PhD. Such an important thing to consider. So you can essentially, there are two things to think about when you want to do a PhD. It's your topic, so the thing you want to research, but then more importantly, I would say, is the person you do your research with. Because if you have someone who is not a good fit for you, it can make it very difficult. I thankfully had a fantastic supervisor. My supervisor was uh, Associate Professor Sarah Martell at UNSW. She has been absolutely fantastic, so supportive, uh, really works within my uh, needs. So sometimes I would just be able to do the work that I wanted to do and just go off on my own and be totally fine. And then there are other times where like, I kind of needed my hand held a little bit, you know, academic hand holding. to be like, I, I don't know what I'm doing, help. And she would help. She would be there at the drop of a hat to help out. Um, even during the last couple of weeks, she would be sending me revisions on the weekends because she knew that I was working on the weekends. And so getting things done. Absolutely fantastic. So consider who you want to have and make sure that they're the sort of people who will communicate in the way that works for you. So if you prefer to communicate over email or in person, or also if your uh, supervisor travels a lot, that might be something you want to consider as well. If they don't travel too much, they'll be more likely there to help you more often. But if they do travel a lot, it might be more difficult to get the support you need. So really make sure you don't pick a PhD supervisor without meeting them and having a conversation with them is my biggest, biggest piece of advice when choosing your PhD supervisor. But with that, good luck. You're at the start of your journey. That's so exciting. I'm at the end of my journey because I just submitted my PhD yesterday. This has been an hour of Ask Me Anything About My PhD. Thank you all so much for joining me. It has been a whirlwind. Apologies for the stream changing uh, <laughs> on YouTube to a different one because for some reason it decided to use my web stream camera, my like <laughs> my laptop camera instead of the additional one that I set up. So thank you for coming to this one and hanging out and chatting and just enjoying <sighs> celebrating the last four years of finishing my PhD. Thank you all so much. I will see you soon with more science content after I take a well-deserved weekend off. <laughs> Until next time, thank you all so much.